Um, I am here to talk about ruthless prioritization for PMs. How many of you are actively PMing or are PMs today? How many of you want to be PMs? How many of you are just here for free food or booze or whatever they're offering you? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's fine too. Um, well, great. Um, I'm here to talk about all those things and uh, happy to network with all y'all later for any specific questions. Um, just more about me. I currently PM at Echo360. We're an edtech SaaS platform um, that sells to um, higher learning institutions and continuing education. We also do predictive analytics so we can tell when a student is failing and improve their outcomes generally by one full grade point average. Um, I've been PMing now for about Oh God, eight years. Um, I, before this, uh, worked at a content marketing SaaS platform. Um, I lived in the city for about seven years. Um, now live in Wilmington, North Carolina. Actually, heard you talking about surfing. Great surfing, Wilmington. Um, but I am generally on a plane. We have offices in London, um, DC, New York, and Perth, Australia. So uh, lots, lots of long flights, and uh, yeah, very up to date on all the movies they play on all the airlines. So can also talk to you about that. Great. So we're going to discuss today is how you determine what's important and how you set the right priorities based on finding that out uh, from the data. Um, from there, how you avoid those sneaky injections uh, through inclusion, data, and making the whole process not about you, but about the customer. Uh, third, protecting your team while funneling through actually useful feedback. Sometimes feedback can be useful. You don't have to protect your team all the time. Um, and finally, staying user focused to ensure product longevity and relevance and not succumbing to kind of short term, um, you know, business um, altercations, if you will. Uh, so first, how do you determine what's important? How do you keep your team focused on it? Um, I like to kind of divvy this up into three separate buckets. Um, you can see here we have uh, three different areas, your current users who are always sort of wondering how will your product help me do what I need to get done? Um, I always love to remind PMs who are, you know, especially in love with their product or in love with their feature area, as you should be, um, that people don't care about your product. People care about getting stuff done. And if your product helps them get stuff done or gets them, gets, helps them get stuff done faster, even better. But they don't necessarily seek out the technology, they seek out the solution. Um, so keeping that in mind while you're building for your current users. Um, for, for prospective users, of course, why should they switch to your product? And keeping in mind the friction of just changing their current workflows in and of itself, even if they know there's a great benefit, is really hard. Um, you know, how many of you have been like told at work you have to do a different kind of email platform or chat platform or anything like that? And even if there is an obvious benefit, you really need to keep in mind that that friction of them making that change is hard, and your your product has to be good enough and even then good enough to convince them that they uh, should take the time and effort to switch. Um, and then of course the competition. Um, I recently switched out this avatar with a bot because robots are taking all our jobs apparently. Um, but you really have to keep in mind within the competitive landscape what is purely defensible within your platform and what is at risk. So you know what is your product kind of good at or known for, whether it's just the history of your user base and knowing them better than anyone else, whether you just have a boat, like a boatload of VC money and you have more money than anyone else and you know you can build faster and just hire teams that way. Um, you just have to have a great idea of your competitive landscape and your competition overall and making sure you're always checking in because that can obviously evolve over time as people may want to dive into your kind of piece of the pie or you know leave or do other things with their features. Which brings us to my favorite thing, setting priority. Um, how many of you have uh, seen this chart before, or heard of the blog Folding Burritos? No, okay, I feel like it's a, it's a requisite for some reason for like good development and PM blogs to have really dumb names, but um, Folding Burritos is one of those, it's a great resource if you haven't heard of it. Um, but he created this sort of um, periodic table of prioritization, if you will. Um, you can see in kind of the top corner, we have uh, kind of quantitative um, data, the bottom qualitative, um, and then in the bottom axis, we have internal and external data. Um, and I like to reference this, especially when I'm going through kind of a new prioritization exercise for a feature or feature set, just to make sure I'm not kind of biasing myself and leaning too hard into one corner or another. Um, so, you know, obviously at the kind of top left, we have for purely quantitative and internal data, a pure financial analysis. Um, how many of you have been sent kind of a random spreadsheet with like seven pivot tables from your CFO and been told to go turn that into, you know, prioritized roadmap? 
um, you know, versus purely on the external qualitative data side, something more like a Moscow, um, where you simply just kind of gut check list out must, should, could, or won't have, um, or speedboat. How many of you have heard of or done the speedboat exercise before? No. Um, okay. It's, it's kind of fun actually, but it's like not super useful. At least I find you'll, you'll literally draw a speedboat on a whiteboard, um, and then have a, you know, customer come up and you'll say, if the speedboat is the product, what are the things you feel like are holding it down? What are the features you hate? What are the features that you wish could be better? And they just go up and kind of post them up there and then you talk through it. Um, it's, it's kind of a better visual way to go through these things. But um, what this is really great for is it's a good way to, again, kind of gut check your type of data and your sources of data and make sure that you're getting a good balance of both of those things, right? So you don't want to be making purely quantitative decisions, and also you don't want to be making purely qualitative decisions. And on the flip side, you don't want to be sourcing your data purely internally from financial models or from you know, uh, your colleagues or your sales cohort. Um, you want ideally that external data as well. So you should be getting regular you know, data reports from your users, what they're doing, how they're doing it, how often they're doing it, um, and also meeting your customers face to face. Um, I don't know how many of you are able to do this. We'll do kind of quarterly roadmap webinars um, as well as conferences with all of our customers. So we're literally able to go to them face to face and say, hey, we have this clickable prototype. Do you mind messing with this and letting us know if you love it or hate it? Or, hey, we're thinking about building off this new feature set. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why or why not? Um, but all of these different sources of data are really important and important to keep in balance as well. Cool. And then also, it's important to keep in mind you want to strive for kind of a good balance of sweet spots for the level of effort. Um, I've highlighted here, you can see kind of high effort, high value, and low effort, high value. Um, obviously, low effort, high value sort of, you know, is obvious why you want to do it. Um, but you're going to have to eventually do a couple of these high effort, high value things. And it's important to sort of pepper them in amongst each other when you can. Um, my team right now is just coming off of a lot of a couple of high effort, high value feature sets. And I've purposely pushed back a couple of these other feature sets I know are also high value and high effort. Um, just because both on the internal side, it makes people feel good when they're able to just kind of produce things quickly and see them out in the world and kind of, you know, get them into the hands of users. Um, but also on the flip side, it's kind of an optics thing. So if sales doesn't see a new feature or feature set for, you know, two months, three months, you know, obviously you're, you're agile and you're rolling out things, you know, sprint by sprint. But if you're not creating something en entirely new that often, it can seem you know, exhausting or stagnant or they're just not really sure what you're working on. Um, so it's, it's good to kind of pepper these two in with each other and sort of you know, break up that rhythm, if you will. All right, um, so how many of you have heard the term swoop and poop? Yeah, a couple, okay, good. The last time I did this talk, no one had heard of it. I was like, what the hell, I don't, okay. Um, so how do you avoid it and how do you then mitigate its recurrence in the future? Um, for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, this quote is from Jared Spool. He's a kind of UX expert in the field. Um, but his explanation is like a seagull on attack. The executive has swooped into the project and pooped all over your team's design, which you lovingly created and spent hours and hours and hours researching and putting together. Flying away as fast as they came, they left carnage and rubble in their wake. Um, how many of you has this happened to before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's super painful. You think you've come up with the answer. You've tested your hypothesis. You have all these lovely clickable prototypes, all these assets, all this data. And then they come in and say, mm, no, I hate it. Also make that blue. And then they leave. And you're like, OK, great, sure. Um, so how do you mitigate this? Or why does this happen in the first place? Um, the three things I've found in, in my experience in dealing with various levels of executives that various levels of passion and competence, to say it politely. Um, first being that there's no shared understanding. So are you sure that they understand why you're building what you're building and not just how and not just what? Um, it's nice to have all these things laid out and it's nice to be you know, cohesive with your designs and maybe you know, show the prototype, show a hardware prototype. Um, but if they don't understand why you're doing it in the first place, they're already gone. They're already kind of second guessing all your decisions. They're already trying to figure out what else you should be using all those resources on. You have to remind them constantly about the why and bring them and focus them back towards the user need. Um, the second being uh, excluding decision makers and or execs at early stages. 
Um, how many of you have heard of the, the RACI model, R-A-C-I? A couple of nods, yeah. Um, I, I've had mixed success in actually kind of implementing it, but it's a good exercise, especially if you're new at a company, to kind of keep in mind what people need to be in the room and what sort of levels of decision making each of them have. Um, so, you know, a lot of times I find people uh, either exclude executives or decision makers because they think, oh, they're too busy or, oh, they don't care, they just wanna see it released, or I'm scared about their feedback, like they're just gonna to totally derail everything. Um, I will tell you firsthand, it is always better to bring them into the fold as early as possible, even if they're, you're just sending them notes for the meeting, even if they're just kind of ducking in and checking in on progress and then leaving. Um, the more you can make them feel included and make them feel part of you know, the decision-making every step of the process, the less they're going to kind of duck in at the ninth hour and totally derail all your plans. Um, and finally, lack of supporting evidence. So, uh, you know, if they come in and they understand the why, they're involved, but you don't really have a good reason for having gotten to the, you know, hypothesis or the, you know, feature that you have, um, it's going to be easy for them to kind of knock it down. So. If you know, they're coming in and you know, they don't understand the output of maybe some user research that you did or um, you know, your kind of munging of data that you got from your kind of internal repo, whether it's Looker or whatever you're using, um, it's really important to make sure you kind of create these artifacts um, of your decision making at every step of a decision making process. So I've actually found a lot of times an exec will come in and say, why did you do it this way? And I'm, if it's a long project, you're kind of sitting there, you're like, I don't remember, why did I do it this way? <laughs> it's a good way to kind of look back and actually say, okay, yeah, these are the data points we had, um, and this is why I made that decision. Cool. Um, so one kind of exercise that um, Jared actually recommends, um, I've done this to kind of mix success, success at different companies, um, but uh, you know, I always kind of recommend it as just kind of a thought exercise or something to, to work through if you haven't. Um, our design sprints. How many of you are familiar with design sprints? A couple, cool, okay. Um, so design sprints uh, were started uh, GV, previously Google Ventures. Um, basically, it's a kind of good, quick, fast and dirty way to validate your ideas and go through your hypotheses and get to something that you can start to sort of test and build on. Um, the kind of key five tenets to it are making sure you understand everything you're building for. So who are your users? What do they actually need? What is the context in which their need needs to be met? Um, any sort of competitive review, like I spoke about earlier, making sure you understand both your strengths and potential weaknesses in the market, especially if you're newly entering a market, it can be tricky. Um, and then formulating your strategy accordingly. Um, from there, diverge, and this is the most fun part, you basically just kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. You wanna make up and think of as many different solutions to the user problem as you can. And so you're basically just developing as many ideas as possible, and then you're coming back together with the group and sort of validating or you know, not validating your ideas. And this is, can be, this is where it's, it's really helpful to sort of go through some exercises like, um, I like to do uh, kind of five minutes, five ideas, so you'll kind of write down one idea per minute and sort of roughly kind of sketch out wireframe really ugly what it could be. Um, I find the five minutes is just long enough where you're like, Ugh, I don't know, whatever, let's make it like Snapchat. And sometimes that's the idea that's actually great. So um, it's good to kind of push yourself and really bring out some stuff that most of it's going to be garbage, but some of it could actually be really interesting. Um, from there, obviously, you decide and start to storyboard um, and my favorite prototype. Um, for this exercise, they should be quick and dirty. They should be focused purely on usability. They should be ugly. You do not want to frame them and put them on your fridge. If they're pretty, if they're in InVision, if they're clickable, you're doing it wrong. They should be fast and ugly. Ideally on like a cocktail napkin at like a dinner with your friends. That's what you want. Um, and finally, validating it. So showing that prototype to real people and learning what does or what doesn't work. Cool. So inevitably, I always get people that say, hey, Cassidy, I tried all this stuff. It doesn't work. My exec's crazy. My team doesn't support me. What's happening? What do I do? Sometimes you just kind of have to kill your darlings or you have to pick your battles. So um, keep in mind, up until this point, you have worked with the dev team. You've worked with the design team. You've worked with the sales and support team to source all of your data. You validated this idea with your users. You have basically a whole team behind you ready to kind of get this thing going. So at this point, really the exec coming in, it's not just you versus the exec. It's you and the, the rest of really the company 
trying to figure out the best way to solve a user problem. And this is where it's really important to make sure the exec doesn't think it's kind of, well, I have the best idea, like you don't have the best idea, I have the best idea. It's always kind of good to refocus the problem on our users want to do this, they can't do this, and they're gonna do it elsewhere and probably pay other people to do it elsewhere if we can't do it. So how can we help our user? Um, especially in areas where you may not have the healthiest relationship with the exec, um, I found refocusing the problem off of you versus them onto the user's problem can be really helpful. Um, and then ultimately, you know, if they're kind of the CEO or exec level that likes to really get into the nitty gritty, really like to kind of second guess every sort of product decision, every now and then you can throw them a bone. Um, I always tell the story of the blue button problem. For some reason we'd want exec that was obsessed with one of our feature sets and the blue, the button to access it had to be blue. Um, our, our branding has absolutely nothing to do with the color blue, so that was like a really interesting and fun thing to deal with <laughs> our design team. But at the end of the day, we're like, you know what, if he wants the blue button, that's great. He can wave that victory and then leave us alone to do other cool stuff. And it, was, it worked, it was great. We just made him feel like it was brilliant and we had the blue button and that was it. Uh, we also then changed it like a month later and he didn't notice, so you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I have a friend that works uh, at a large publishing company for news. Um, and she uh, was working with a problematic executive um, who really wanted uh, this very specific feature set. And it would derail the team by like a month and a half. It made absolutely no sense. There was zero data both within the competitive landscape and within her users that would validate it. Um, so she said, great, we'll run a A-B test and we'll get back to you. Guess what test she never ran? Guess who never got back to her? It, it, you know, so sometimes they just want to feel like they're heard and they're part of the process. And again, by including them in the process early on, hopefully you won't even get to this point in the first place. All right, cool. Um, so after all this, you've set your priority, you have your hypotheses validated, you're ready to build, your team is ready to rock and roll, you still need to protect them. So how can you do that accordingly and how can you embrace this term, the shit umbrella? Who here has heard of the term shit umbrella? Yeah, okay, I only got one, really, okay. This is like one of my favorites. Um, I'll get into shit umbrella in a little bit. Um, I created this super shitty meme, um, but basically, <laughs> um, this is just to say, um, I've seen this be a problem at smaller companies, more so than bigger companies where process is, is pretty stringent, but um, you get the kind of problem with sales where they'll go to a mom product and say, hey, I really need this thing in order to close this account. And product says, no, we have this prioritized roadmap, which we prioritize in these various ways with our data to support it. Uh, you know, I need basically more data from you in order to add this to our roadmap. So sales goes to dad. They go to development and say, hey, how long would this take to do? Can you just like do it on the side and like not really tell anyone and you don't need to make a Jira ticket for it? Which is a total nightmare. Um, so this is kind of where it comes in. You need to sort of train people accordingly. Um, I will lovingly remind sales every now and then, hey, if you need something, you come to product. Otherwise, it's not going to get prioritized or you're going to make us mad and that's definitely not the way to get stuff prioritized. Um, but on the flip side, you have to make sure that dev is following process as well. So remind dev if sales goes to them directly that they're not superheroes if they start coding random shit on the weekend that's not prioritized. Um, if anything, it's great if they say, hey, that's a great idea. You know who you should tell about that idea? Product. So um, it's also important to, when you're discussing with especially inje injections coming from sales or um, customer success managers that have kind of a um, you know, dollar amount tied to their uh, performance quarterly, um, to put it within tangible costs. Um, I always love the always be closing um, from Glenn Gary. Um, but as our, our head of sales lovingly says, sales is coin operated. So you have to put things within their perspective accordingly. Um, so if you're attaching tangible hours or an actual tangible cost to pivoting away from your roadmap, you'd be surprised how quickly people are like, oh no, no, that's okay, I can wait. Or like, oh no, I actually don't really need that thing. Um, so instead of you know them looking kind of at Roadmonk or a prioritized roadmap and sort of having to abstract, you know, times or effort, you can literally tell them, okay, um, you know, back of the napkin math based on the developers I know I need on this, I need two backend folks and one front end person and QA um, and PMM and resources to launch. Um, this is roughly gonna take, you know, uh, two months and, you know, depending on people's you know, salaries and time, uh, an additional, you know, 10 to 15K. Is that cool with you? You're gonna tell head of sales that you were pivoting from whatever we were doing before? 
Um, and again, just by attaching those very tangible costs and hours, you'd be surprised how often they kind of back down um, because they're just, it's not easy for them to think about those things when they're just looking purely at a roadmap. Um, and finally, keeping in mind that conversation does not equal production. Um, so again, going back to constantly validating your why and socializing your why with the rest of the company. Um, we do this very regularly internally because our company is uh, fully remote. Um, so we'll have um, bi-weekly sort of um, demos and reviews for internal um, stakeholders, um, as well as specific meetings for product marketing and sales and specific meetings for development and QA. Um, we do tons of one-on-ones and retros and other ceremonies, which should be part of your agile kind of process generally anyway. Um, we do regular working sessions with cohorts of customers. This is a great way, again, to bring in, you know, stakeholders don't necessarily have to be internal. These can be key accounts that are, you know, have been at the company for a while or super passionate users. Um, I think it was, yeah, I think it was the CEO of, um, shoot, what is that email company? I'm blanking on it. Um, Superhuman? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Um, and he recently did a breakdown of kind of how they found their most passionate users and really drilled down on those users. And those users can you know, be stakeholders too. And it's important to keep them into the fold early. Um, we do that through working sessions in each of our different regions of our offices. Um, but any way you can reach your users and get them together and kind of you know, get those ideas flowing, the better. Um, and then finally, of course, roadmap review sessions or webinars. Um, we don't have a public roadmap, but a lot of companies do. Um, I think Buffer still has a public roadmap. They're an interesting, you know, kind of use case. So you can check that out. Um, but again, um, you know, transparency to a certain point around your roadmap can also be really helpful. Um, all right, great. Um, so going back to the shit umbrella, um, you were trying to protect your team from all these supposed shit coming from uh, sales or support or anyone else internally. Um, but again, you have to keep in mind it's not you versus them. It's not them versus anyone. Um, everyone is just trying to do what they think is best for the user and what's best for the customer. And it can be really hard to keep that in mind at the end of the day when you said no a thousand times and uh, people just want what they want and they want to close their numbers and it's the end of the quarter and people get really frustrated. Kind of people doing what they think is best um, you know, within their company. Um, and then sometimes I always get people saying, well, what if they really just don't like me or what if it really is just shit? Leave. No company is worth that. There's somewhere better you should be if, you know, I think Julie says, yeah, it's simply impossible to muster the belief that you're not surrounded by shit. Then maybe it's time to seek greener pastures because why on earth would you insist on staying somewhere that rains shit all the time? Cool. Um, and finally, the importance of staying user focused. Um, so how you can be weary of short term uh, business gains, a trade off for overall long term poor user experiences. Um, for this section, I'm going to go into kind of two more specific examples. Um, the kind of, uh, how many of you read highlights? Are you familiar with Goofus and Gallant? Okay. It's, I know, like a really, it's a stretch, but I'm going to go through kind of Spotify as the Gallant and Google as the Goofus. Sorry if anyone works at Google. Sorry. Um, but Spotify is a great example of kind of inclusive design versus, you know, sort of short-term business goals. I'll break those down. Um, versus Google has gotten kind of a little bit of flack recently for constantly deploying uh, sort of half-baked MVPs and sunsetting them, you know, getting people just hooked enough and then sort of shutting it down. And especially if you're a developer working off their APIs, that sucks. So I just want to talk through it. Um, all right, so Spotify, their dev blog, just kind of generally, if you're not following it already, is super awesome. Um, so I'd recommend it. But um, they recently covered something they call inclusive design. So you want to ensure that you are kind of going through the exercise of not just validating what your user wants and need, but making sure that it's something that is good for them in the long term. Um, you can even kind of go into the exercise of, is it ethical what I'm doing and what I'm building? Um, a lot of people talked a lot recently about the kind of black mirror test of your product, if you will. Um, so they're sort of always keeping in mind the balance of user trust and well-being um, versus short-term business goals um, when they are building out new feature sets or modifying existing feature sets. Um, the text is a little small here, I apologize, but I can kind of go through these. So um, things to keep in mind where you could be harming your users are things, of course, like physical harm. Uh, this could include sleep deprivation, financial strain, um, loss of PII, hello, literally every company recently, um, accidents due to distraction, um, violence or even death. 
um, emotional harm, so betrayal of trust or privacy, harm to relationships, um, anxiety, depression, um, or societal harm, so uh, exclusion, reinforcing stereotypes, political polarization, um, unequal opportunity, or discrimination. Um, I think discrimination especially has come into a lot of discussions around algorithms and any sort of you know, influences that developers have in generating those algorithms. Um, but these are all really sort of interesting things to just kind of think about when you're thinking through your feature sets. Um, and on the incentive side, these are some of the excuses you may hear from the business end where you kind of have to keep your ears perked up to make sure you can sort of uh, thwart them. So things like, uh, we really just need exponential growth. We got, we got to get that hockey stick growth. Got to be up and to the right. I don't care what we do. Just make people swipe more. Or uh, science. So, well, there's some data saying this is bad, but uh, there could be some data saying this is good, but we don't want to wait, so let's just do it. Um, or, of course, my favorite, Reckless Speed, who hasn't heard it move fast and break things, but if you're a, uh, let's say, an engineer at Boeing, that's a bad idea, <laughs> um, just to be, you know, timely. Um, you know, there really are a lot of um, software platforms and, you know, uh, other just products generally where I feel like people forget that the kind of mantra, move fast and break things, is not healthy. Um, I work at an education SaaS platform. Um, what my team does and what I do as a PM directly correlates to students' outcomes. And if they're not able to learn, and if it is detrimental to their education, that's on me. That's on my team. That's my fault. So it's important to kind of keep these things in mind that your users are real people, and you need to think through these things as a PM. Cool. On the flip side, um, how many of you have had a tool that you use that Google made that they sunset? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was an inbox user. Um, I'm still pretty uh, upset about it. Um, also, dodgeball, Google Wave, like low-key really liked Google Wave. Anyone else? No? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, look, it, it's constantly growing. You can actually look at, I think, the, the website I source this from, from uh, I'll look later, is like Google Graveyard, but there's literally an open source project where people can just like put in information around like dead Google projects. Um, anyway, it's extremely frustrating. So you need to remember when you're kind of building these, these tools for your users, um, again, going back to kind of the uh, new user, not just your existing users, how are you convincing them that what you have is that much better, but also not only that much better, uh, that it's worth it for them to make the switch. So a lot of these you know, platforms, most of them are direct to consumer, but um, Google also makes a lot of APIs that are for developers who can then build their own features and own feature sets off of those APIs. Um, and if you know, they're given a sunset notice of like a cool 15 days, that's like not enough to pivot their entire business off that API and figure out an alternative you know, source. Um, Ron Amadeo recently wrote, I think at Ars Technica, um, a really good article, but he just kind of outlines the fact that Google is inherently a platform company. Um, Google constantly asks for investment from consumers, developers, and partner companies and the things it builds. Any successful platform will pretty much require trust and buy-in from these groups. And these groups need to feel the platform they invest in today will be there tomorrow or they'll move on to something else. Um, I don't know if any of you are kind of active gamers, but I know Strava was released recently and a lot of the questions were basically around, will you exist in two years? Like, can I actually play the games that I want to play that will be on your platform? Um, so there's kind of a lot of agita around this and it's, it's important that your users feel like you're going to be around for long enough and support them um, especially if you are sunsetting their feature onto a better um, or you know, equivalent within your platform. Um, all right, cool. So we talked about how you determine what's important and then setting that priority. Um, again, I recommend for any of you check out the uh, Folding Burritos prioritization framework. Um, avoiding injections through inclusion data and making it not about you, but about the user's problem. Um, protecting your team, being the shit umbrella while funneling through the occasional useful feedback. It does happen. Um, and finally, making sure you stay user focused for product longevity, for health and also for the health of your users as well. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'll be around at the networking session after this. Love to chat with all of you. Um, you can also find me at LinkedIn. I'm taking kind of a health break from Twitter, but sometimes you can find me there. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you all for the time. And I'll take questions too if any of you have any. Yeah. Sorry. 
Yes, not for downloads, but like for kind of looking. Yeah, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting you summarize your or end your presentation with something brought up. And we talk about frameworks of privatization. What frameworks as, as a PM would you follow to determine if it's the right thing to sunset a product? Interesting. So it's actually, I have a running joke with my friend as a PM, love killing products. Nothing is more satisfying than killing a product. Um, I don't have a specific framework. I guess I would say that's where you really want to get into the weeds of are you addressing the right kind of user base? So one reason maybe you get to sunset a product is if your kind of user base is naturally dwindled. If it just doesn't make financial sense for you to be in that market anymore, you need to transfer them into kind of a different feature set you already support or a new feature set you want to build. Um, this kind of, I guess, goes back to sort of understanding your competitive landscape. If you start to see that the users you're serving just you can't upsell them or they're not consistent or, um, for example, in my business right now, the U.S. Um, financial market around education is really brittle. So we tend to find contracts won't last longer than a year max because there's so much funding insecurity. Whereas in Australia, we have five-year, seven-year, ten-year contracts because they're just not concerned. Um, so that's, I would say, where you should really go back and ensure that you understand your competitive landscape and kind of maybe run more of those sort of quant analyses before you dive into anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.